present an overview of his, his doctoral research today, and then uh, we'll adjourn to his, uh, his final defense. So uh, I was thinking of how to introduce Ryan, and I was going to say he had an, uh, a non-conventional path, but I don't think there is a conventional path to a PhD. Everybody's got their own challenges and, and uh, distractions. But I have to say, Ryan's path was, was uh, uh, really pretty unique. So he started uh, as a young man about, on a path about as far away from academia as you could, as you could take. He, he elected not to go to college. He had been a short order cook, and he focused on his, uh, his kitchen career. And he worked his way up from short order cook to executive chef. He actually managed uh, three large restaurants, in the kitchens at three large restaurants in the Richmond area. And that was a really successful career path. There was no reason necessarily to ever break out of that. Who knows how rich and famous he'd be by now in the, in the kitchen world. Uh, but to his credit, uh, along that path, he decided he really did want a college degree. He, he didn't want to turn away from academia completely. And so he took a pause in his, his culinary path to go back to college. And in going back to college, he realized what he really liked was biology and organismal biology and really pretty much birds. Uh, at least that's what he was introduced to. Um, in, in his undergraduate studies. Um, and so, and, and, and that was at Virginia Commonwealth University. And, uh, and because he did undergraduate research in, in bird coloration, uh, he found uh, our lab at, at Auburn, where we mostly do uh, bird coloration. And so that's what he settled into. Uh, he was going to uh, do some research on the mechanisms that control coloration of birds, and he'll talk about some some stuff he did do on that today. But about a year into his, his dissertation, uh, the initial projects weren't working too well. well they, they were mostly challenging. It was really good ideas, but birds were just hard to do the things we wanted to do, hybridization and stuff. And, uh, and one day I just uh, uh, called him into my office with a new idea. I said, hey, let's do copepods instead of birds. And so I think we would have just totally freaked out most of my bird uh, <laughs> students. But, Ryan thought about it for a while and he said, yeah, sounds like a good idea, let's do copepods." pods. So me saying to Ryan, let's do copepods" pods meant, you go out there and get some copepods, pods, and figure the whole system out <laughs> and, uh, and see if this crazy idea that we've got works. And to his credit, Ryan flew out to California, got copepods, pods, and the rest is history. Uh, and the history's been pretty good. Ryan's had a really successful run through grad school, he's, he's right on target, finishing five years uh, with no uh, prior graduate experience. Uh, and I should have counted up before I came in. I think Ryan has around six publications now, but, but several really, really high profile publications. A recent paper in, in Nature Communications, a paper in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. And his core uh, dissertation work is yet to even be published yet. So um, it's, it's He's taken a, a really vague idea and made a lot out of it. And so I'm anxious to hear Ryan's summary of the work. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Jeff, for the introduction. And thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your attendance. And uh, it's nice to see so many familiar faces in the crowd. So thanks. So from Jeff's introduction, you know a little bit more about me. It's true I was an ex executive chef of a restaurant group for some time before getting started in science. And it's been about 10 years since I quit that. Uh, career as a chef, and and, uh, and it's kind of crazy to think that I'm actually here defending uh, my dissertation today. Uh, if you just look at the title of my talk, Evolutionary and Physiological Processes Involved in Carotenoid Coloration in Animals, I didn't know what some of those words meant 10 years ago, <laughs> so I'm not sure if I do now either, but we'll talk about that. Uh, but, you know, it's certainly come a long way. I have quite a few people to thank for helping me get here, uh, but I'm going to save that for the end of my talk. Uh, I think right now a fair amount of credit ne uh, needs to be given to this little yellow bird, and specifically uh, its bright yellow coloration. This was the focus of my first undergraduate research project, and that project really got me excited about nature and, and learning science to be able to ask questions about natural processes, and really solidified a, a plan for me to pursue that as my, my second career. Um, so in that project I looked at how Yellow coloration among individuals varied across different habitat types on the non-breeding grounds of this bird in Panama. And we know that 
the yellow coloration of this bird comes from pigments called carotenoids. And in fact, most of the yellow, orange, and red colors that animals display for coloration uh, come from carotenoid pigments. Um, so this process occurs in a lot of other animals, but I'm just going to use birds mostly as an example uh, today. And when I first started the research project as an undergraduate, I really hadn't heard of carotenoids before. And as I began to read the literature and, and learn more about how animals use them for coloration, I was captivated by this idea that, that carotenoid coloration was thought to be an honest signal of individual quality, because it's dependent on the condition of the animal. So it's a condition-dependent trait. And what that means is that for birds that are red, the redder the better, and for birds that are yellow, the yellower the better. So the intensity or the richness of that, like I say, of that coloration is thought to be directly related to the quality uh, and condition of the birds. And that's how it's honestly signaling. Well, at least that's the way I learned it, and perhaps you did as well. It makes for a pretty nice, clean story. Uh, but through my dissertation research, I'm going to show you that there's some important details that have been left out of this the discussion on this topic. Perhaps that it, this nice clean story needs to be updated just a little bit. So the go-to example of condition-dependent coloration uh, in birds has often been house finches, where males that are uh, high-quality males show this uh, rich red plumage coloration, and males that are in poorer condition uh, have this much drabber feather coloration, not quite as red, ranging from, even from orange uh, to yellow in some cases. Um, and females pay attention to male coloration during mate choice, and they tend to pair and mate with the reddest individuals they can find. So this is how carotenoid coloration can play a role in evolutionary processes by, by impacting fitness through, like in this case, a female mate choice for coloration, or in other systems, male-male competition, uh, gauging that potential competition through their um, carotenoid-based orientation. But there's an obvious question that arises here. If carotenoid-based coloration is thought to be an honest signal, of quality, then what prevents cheating? Why can't this low quality male just load up on carotenoids and become as red as he can and trick the female into, into mating? It certainly would be a benefit to him. Um, but before I can, uh, well, this question was, was the major motivation for my first dissertation chapter that was published in Philosophical Transactions uh, last year with my former lab mate Becca and, and Jeff on his co authors. And in, in this review, I uh, go over some old ideas about how cheating is prevented in, in carotenoid-based coloration systems. And then I also introduce a, a newer hypothesis um, that could explain uh, some, some honest signaling in, in multiple systems that would that as well. Um, and I think that the new hypothesis that I've put forward will really help push the field forward in finally understanding some of the mechanisms involved in carotenoid coloration and how that could influence the relationship between color and quality. Okay. Um, before I go on to the question of what prevents cheating, I just need to talk a little bit more about how animals use carotenoids for coloration. So we know that most animals have to get carotenoids from their diet. They can't just make them from, from scratch. And the majority of carotenoids in the diet of animals are yellow xanthophils. Okay? So once a, an animal or a bird has those carotenoids in its system, there's two basic ways to use them to become colorful. The first is, is this pathway here, where the, the bird will just take the, the yellow pigments from its diet and deposit them into their feathers or, or the integument in the same form from which they came. Okay, so no, no changes. Okay, so let's get back to our question. What prevents cheating? Well, the most popular answer to date is that honest signals coloration in this case, are costly to produce. All right, so that means that uh, it's, the cost is relative to the quality of the individual as well. So it makes it too costly for those low quality animals to, uh, to get any benefit from producing the, the uh, preferred signal. And as a result, they signal their inability to, to uh, pay that cost. And the resource trade-off hypothesis is the, um, is the most popular mechanism for how these costs manifest. All right. And, and prevent cheating. And this model relies heavily on the, uh, the assumption that uh, in addition to being used for coloration, carotenoids are also uh, important in physiological functions such as antioxidant protection and uh, boosting of the immune system. Um, so the way that this model works is that this trade-off, um, using carotenoids for ornamentation, 
comes at the cost of not being able to use those for physiological processes. So a male that's in good condition produces that preferred signal is, is showing that he can actually afford to, to invest those resources uh, in, in coloration, and as a result, um, that is, that is, the coloration is tied to its quality. If we consider a male that's in poorer condition, uh, or, or worse quality, he either has a smaller pool of these resources or the larger demands for body maintenance because of some illness or, or other physiological problems. And it, as, a, as a result, can't invest as many carotenoids towards coloration and doesn't produce that preferred signal. But this model does assume uh, implicitly that this bird could cheat. It could allocate resources towards uh, coloration. It's just simply not worth it. So if that were to happen, uh, the, the net result would be uh, you know, a severe fitness decline and death in, in this case. So it could, this model assumes that it could produce red feathers, it's simply that it's not worth it to do that. Okay? All right. So this is a pretty straightforward model and perhaps that's um, why it's been so popular in the animal coloration field. It's fairly intuitive. Um, but I think this model has a couple of uh, issues that I'm going to talk about uh, now. So first, it assumes that carotenoids are a limiting resource, and that's really how this trade-off uh, uh, comes about. If you don't uh, have a finite pool of uh, resources, you can only allocate them uh, in, in such a way. But we don't really have good evidence to support that uh, assumption. The model starts to fall apart. Second problem I see here is that whether or not carotenoids are actually relevant, uh, physiologically relevant in some animal systems for, for antioxidant function or, or immune uh, function is also quite contentious. Uh, there's evidence in support and against that idea. Um, and lastly, what I'm going to focus on here is that it pretty much completely ignores that process of converting yellow carotenoids to red. It assumes it has no uh, uh, place in determining the relationship between color and quality. And um, obviously, I, I think a little bit differently about that. So, so there has to be an, another way. So that's the first answer uh, to why uh, cheating uh, is, is uh, discouraged is because of signal costs. Now, what's the second answer to our question? Well, most people in the animal coloration field would say that what I just said is a trick question. There is no other answer. This is the, the only one. Um, and I, uh, I argue that there are some established alternative mechanisms uh, that can maintain honesty that have been uh, uh, around for a long time, but uh, people in the animal coloration field might not be aware of. Okay? So, and the second answer is that cheating is from behavioral is as high up as they can. Okay? And the scratch height is a function of their body size and their height. Okay? I guess the tiger could jump or something, but let's assume they don't. Um, and so, this is an honest signal of its body size, and you can't fake that. Okay, so uh, territory markings are used as a, a signal of, of uh, body size and deterring other males from coming in. Okay, so if that doesn't make sense, let's try an example that gets a little closer to home. <laughs> let's consider that we have two augs, one big and one small, and they're rolling tum uh, tumors oak, the, good, the one that's good. Um, and <laughs> the toilet paper height is, is, a, a, is a function of their body size. Okay, so this would be an honest signal of the size of the aug height of the toilet paper in the tree. Okay, I think we all got that uh, with that example. All right, so this might be pretty easy to grasp, height and throwing something high or whatever. How does this work when we, when we talk about carotenoid coloration? How can that work? Well, previously we proposed this model, uh, uh, Jeff's paper in 2011, and I kind of expanded on that in, in our paper, or if you consider the, the kind of uh, basal processes that give rise to fitness and, and quality of an individual like this. Uh, immune response, it's reproductive output, uh, redox uh, state, all these things are, are under control of some core cellular process. Okay, so this is what we're going to call quality for now. And the way that coloration links up uh, to this process is that through this shared pathway. Okay, so the, the process, processes that give rise to, to the quality of an in individual actually shares a pathway with this carotenoid metabolism uh, pathway that is linked up during this conversion step. Okay, so carotenoid conversion is really what's tying these two processes together. All right, so that's what we call the shared pathway hypothesis with emphasis on uh, carotenoid conversion. But under this framework, it's not really clear how dietary carotenoid coloration would link to this process. Okay, so we might expect a much tighter link when we do have that conversion of carotenoids. Okay. 
All right, so these are the two uh, distinct hypothesized mechanisms for preventing cheating, either costly trade-offs or through these shared pathways. And these two models have very different predictions, especially when it comes to carotenoid conversion. So let's take a look at, uh, to visualize these predictions. The shared pathway hypothesis predicts that if you look at the relationship between color and, and quality, there's going to be a much stronger relationship for birds or animals that use uh, coloration from converted carotenoids and a much weaker relationship uh, for birds that skip that conversion step and just use those dietary pigments for color. All right, so that's the shared pathway hypothesis. The uh, resource trade-off hypothesis essentially just lumps all those carotenoids together. It doesn't make a distinction between them. And here we predict a, a general positive relationship when we look at all those carotenoids combined. Okay. All right, so I tested these predictions uh, in using meta-analysis in a, a paper that was published earlier this year in Nature Communications with uh, a bunch of great co-authors, Eduardo Santos from the York University of Sao Paulo, um, Anna Tucker, Alan Wilson, and, and my advisor, Jeff. Um, okay, so despite the fact that I've been talking about carotenoids being uh, uh, thought to be honest signals of quality, uh, the relationship between color and quality, when you look through the literature, is um, often uh, not very clear. When you look across studies, results uh, from different species will show different patterns. Sometimes we see a pretty clear, rela positive relationship between color and quality, and other times uh, we, we don't see that pattern at all. So it's surprisingly inconsistent, given the, the notion that it's supposed to be an honest signal. So, what's going on here? Well, because of the dominance of the resource trade-off hypothesis, every review and meta-analysis to date uh, has been lumping all these carotenoids uh, together and trying to figure out uh, where honest signaling really falls out. Um, but I took a different approach. I did something very simple, uh, but uh, essentially I just split these studies up um, based on whether or not birds used carotin uh, converted carotenoids for coloration or for these dietary carotenoids for coloration. Now, I hypothesized that considering whether those carotenoids were converted or not would help explain some of those discrepancies in the, in the literature. And I, I specifically predicted that we'd see a, a stronger positive relationship between color and quality from these converted groups and, and not from the dietary, a much weaker relationship there. Okay, so I uh, tested these predictions using meta-analysis. And if, if you're not familiar with meta-analysis, uh, it's a powerful way to statistically compare uh, some big picture results from a bunch of studies that are all focused on the same topic. So in this case, uh, coloration from, from uh, birds. So essentially, uh, we combine all the results from these individual studies, do some, depending on who you ask, complicated statistics, um, and we're able to test some hypotheses about the underlying framework of um, carotenoid-based signaling that really just is not possible from an individual study. So meta-analysis is a powerful way to, to get at things like that. All right, so just briefly over some, some methods. Um, I searched with some standardized search terms on Google Scholar and Web of Science to come up with this many uh, papers on the relationship between carotenoid color and, and, uh, and quality in animals. And I put them through this um, a priori selection uh, step where I would wanted to hone in on my question of interest, and that's bird coloration. So looking for papers on birds that measured some, uh, some, in some way uh, carotenoid-based feather coloration and then also related that to some measure of quality. Now, what is exactly quality? I pr proposed uh, a model of that earlier, but in, in general, in evolutionary biology, the idea of quality has been kind of a moving target. So I've kind of tried to group them into four basic categories here, um, best I could based on what other people have done in the literature. So looking at measures of uh, body condition, usually size adjusted for mass, um, measures of parasite resistance, bunch of measures of immune function generally taken from the circulatory system and measures of the parental and reproductive output. So I'm going to look at um, these uh, in general, just lump them all together, and then I'm going to look at how color relates to each one of these categories individually in that analysis here. Okay, so after going through all these, these steps, this filter step, I ended up with 191 results from 50 different studies that looked at 19 species of passerine birds. And from that data set, I collected, or well, I calculated the strength of the, of the relationship between color and quality. So what we're really interested in here is the slopes of these lines. And what we can, um, one way to quantify this, this slope here is, uh, is cor um, excuse me, uh, Fisher's Z-transformed correlation coefficient. So 
uh, well, lower numbers on this scale mean a weaker relationship between color and quality and higher numbers would mean a stronger relationship. And I'm going to present the results uh, like this, where the effect size, so this is ZR, the effect describing this relationship, is going to be on the x-axis, and I'm going to plot that for each one of these carotenoid types, either lumping all the carotenoids together or looking at converted coloration or dietary coloration separately. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at the results. When we look at quality overall, uh, we can see that looking at all the carotenoid coloration studies combined, see a modest positive relationship between color and quality. I'm showing you the, uh, post, the point estimate of the posterior mean and the 95% credible intervals. And when those overlap zero, the credible intervals, uh, it's not statistically uh, robust not technically not different than uh, no effect at all on average. Okay, so that's the prediction from the resource trade-off hypothesis. Let's take a look at how this falls out when we separate those carotenoid types. When we look at coloration from, uh, from dietary carotenoids, we see a much weaker relationship between color and quality. That's, again, not different from no relationship at all. But let's take a look at converted carotenoid coloration. And we see a much stronger positive relationship that's robust and indicating that coloration from, from this strategy is on average an honest signal of quality, where coloration from, from dietary carotenoids is, is not. So this is huge. This has not been uh, demonstrated before. Uh, again, previously we just kind of lumped them all together and saw how it worked out, but now we're showing this conversion step. It looks like it might be an important uh, factor in, in honest signaling. All right, so that's just lumping all the quality categories overall. Let's look at how this uh, falls out in some of the particular category. So when we look at parasite resistance and, and measures of parental uh, reproduction, we see the same pattern where uh, coloration from converted carotenoids and not dietary uh, carotenoids is tightly linked with quality. But importantly, when we look at other measures of quality, such as body condition and immune function, it doesn't matter what type of uh, carotenoid we're, we're interested in here. On average, it's not a robust signal of those measures. Okay? So this is uh, somewhat surprising as well. Okay, so just to wrap up this, hashtag not all carotenoids. <laughs> I tried to get that going on Twitter, no one's picked it up. <laughs> Maybe you guys can help. Um, so it looks like not, uh, not all carotenoids are tightly linked to quality. That conversion step looks like it's important in determining that relationship. Um, and again, we can't just make this blanket statement that carotenoid coloration is not a signal of quality because it's not linked to all measures of quality and it's, it's not true for all carotenoid types. So carotenoid conversion looks like it's important. All right, so far I've shown that resource trade-off, the resource trade-offs are not the only mechanism that can maintain honesty from carotenoid-based ornaments. And um, there's some support for the shared pathway hypothesis with that focus on conversion. Uh, and that looks like it's making the, the honest signal more reliable. Okay. But an important question remains. I've left things somewhat vague here in, in the functionality of some core cellular process. So what, how could uh, uh, coloration and, and all these seemingly disparate measures of quality uh, link up? Well, specifically, I propose that it's functionality of the mitochondria. So each one of these uh, kind of circles can be directly or indirectly tied to the functionality of the mitochondria, and we're proposing that uh, for this, to, for coloration to be able to signal all these things, it too, the carotenoid conversion too, must be dependent on uh, the functionality of these mitochondria. Okay, so this is a model that produces some testable predictions about the physiological processes involved in, in carotenoid coloration. And the best approach uh, for this, to test this model, would be to manipulate some aspects of mitochondrial function in animals that do this conversion and then see how that affects the process. Um, but there's a problem here, as Je Jeff mentioned at, at the beginning of uh, my talk here. Doing these kinds of experiments that really get answers that we, we need in birds is uh, not very practical and in some cases not very ethical. This is a pretty wild, hy <laughs> a wild hypothesis. Um, so we want to work this out in a system that's more amenable to experimentation and um, easier to work with in general. And despite the wide taxonomic distribution of carotenoids in, in a, a bunch of animals, an ideal model system to do this work really hasn't been identified. And as Jeff mentioned in, uh, in the beginning, uh, in an interesting story he can tell you more about, he essentially went to a, a talk at a conference and, and it happened to be a copepod coloration talk and comes back and says, oh yeah, let's work on copepods. 
Um, so these are tiny marine crustaceans, and um, and that was the model I was, I was uh, supposed to work on. So you have to remember, I came into this uh, grad school experience wanting to know about birds, wanting to work with birds, had questions about birds. So, uh, and now Jeff's all like, oh, cocoa pops have color. And like, oh, uh, I don't know. So I was pretty skeptical uh, at first, but then I came across this essay by G.E. Hutchinson. It's called Copapodology for the Ornithologist. Now I can't think of a better <laughs> description of the transition I was exactly making, so I was, I was encouraged by this. And uh, by the time I got to the end of this essay, I, I, I had a good uh, feeling that I was on the right track. I came across this passage, the concluding sentence, where Hutchinson encouraged the reader to, to concentrate on those aspects of copapodological research for which some vertebrate analogies exist and have been inadequately emphasized before. Okay, so what's the process that has been inadequately uh, emphasized but exists in vertebrates and crustaceans and copepods? Well, the metabolic conversion of yellow dietary carotenoids to, to red carotenoids. So birds get it from seeds and insects mostly, and, and uh, copepods get it from the algae that they eat. So this process is conserved across any taxa that eats yellow carotenoids and turns them into the red ones for, for, um, for coloration. From a biochemical perspective, uh, the reactions are exactly the same. Okay, so I use these marine copepods, Tyreopus californicus. And as you can see, uh, we've got this, this is their characteristic orange to deep red coloration. It looks a little bit lighter here because of the, the light that's coming through, but they're pretty red um, uh, animals. But despite that you know, striking coloration, very little work has been done on understanding how they become red. Um, we know that the redness comes from the red carotenoid astaxanthin, but how do they get there? Uh, you know, I, I previously said it's very likely that it's using yellow carotenoids from its diet to, to convert them into red, but some <coughs> algae actually produce astaxanthin directly, so they could just be eating it and not going through that conversion step. Um, so this would be a big problem if I want to test our hypothesis, so I needed to, to work this out. So I conducted some uh, targeted feeding experiments to, um, to test uh, that they make sure they were actually doing the conversion I was interested in. And this was published uh, earlier this year also in the Journal of Plankton Research with uh, Paul Cobain and, and Jeff on as authors. And we got the cover. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, that, yeah, my first cover. So <laughs> trying to get copepods out there. <laughs> Thanks for reading this. Um, so the great thing about working with these copepods um, is that mm -hmm. in the wild they eat algae and, and produces red coloration, but in the lab I've got complete control over their access to carotenoids through their diet. So when you switch these guys to a, uh, a nutritional yeast diet that has no carotenoids present in them, they lose their characteristic coloration and uh, pretty much are devoid of carotenoids. There's small but uh, detectable amounts of astaxanthin in them, but essentially starting from a blank slate, I uh, can introduce carotenoids into their diet and see if they can turn them into the red carotenoids. So here are some proposed pathways for how um, uh, some aquatic animals and other animals get from dietary carotenoids down to keto carotenoids. So there's these three different pathways, and I'm highlighting here some very common um, yellow uh, xanthophyll carotenoids that are present in the diet, and also um, down here, uh, canthoxanthin, a red carotenoid, but it's still upstream of astaxanthin. So what I did was starting from these uh, yeast-fed copepods with no carotenoids in, in their system, essentially, I fed them, uh, I split them into four groups, and each group got just one of these dietary uh, precursors that are upstream of astaxanthin. Mm -hmm. All right, so I gave them to them for, and then for a, a couple days later, I took them out and measured the carotenoids that were present in their system. And essentially this is gonna tell us whether or not they convert dietary carotenoids to astaxanthin. So let's take a look. Yes, thankfully they do. <laughs> um, in each, so in each one of these groups that are upstream of astaxanthin, they produced uh, a de uh, detectable amount of, of astaxanthin in their tissues. And um, the only carotenoid found in their tissues is astaxanthin, and, uh, and in their guts you only find these four carotenoids. So they take all of those carotenoids and convert them into astaxanthin, but we can see that some uh, precursors lead to more astaxanthin than, than others. Um, that's interesting in its own right, but for now we're just gonna focus on, yes, they take yellow carotenoids and they convert them into astaxanthin, the, the red uh, carotenoid. So they're doing that conversion step, and now we can move on. Okay, so now um, I've got a system where I can uh, 
uh, manipulate aspects of their mitochondrial function and, um, and test for this ability to uh, convert carotenoids. Uh, okay. All right, so there's two basic ways that I'm going to uh, talk about today that I've induced mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, the first is using a chemical disruptor, in this case, exposure to copper. And then uh, next I'll tell you about how I genetically, genetically manipulated mitochondrial function using hybridization. The first experiment, I'm using a sister uh, species to the tax I just described, uh, Tigeriopis japonicus. So let's talk about copper. So copper is a, an essential um, element in biological systems where it forms some uh, critical redox-based reactions that are, that are uh, essential for uh, cellular functions, especially in mitochondria. And um, the, uh, the organisms tightly regulate copper uh, transport and, and quantities because of its redox potential. It, it's, um, it can be harmful when it's um, in large quantities and in, in small quantities it, it's quite beneficial for, for the animal. So they've got tight control over copper homeostasis. There's two main players that I'm going to highlight. Uh, glutathione, which after copper gets imported into the cell, uh, it can act to bind to copper. But in order for that to happen, uh, it has to be in its reduced state. So glutathione reductase, GR here, makes that happen. It takes it from its oxidized state and puts it in, in, in its reduced state to bind to copper, where it can be transported throughout the cell. One of the main targets for um, copper in the cells is the mitochondria. Uh, so we're going to zoom on into the mitochondria and show how copper is incorporated. So we're zoomed in here to the inner mitochondrial membrane. This is, and this is the membrane, this is the electron transport system. I'm going to talk about this uh, quite a bit for the rest of my talk. I'll, I'll go over more details then, but for now, just know that the copper that's imported in the mitochondria, the target for that is the fourth complex of this electron transport system, where two coppers form the, the redox center of this, um, this protein and are essential for its, for its function. Okay, so at, at small quantities, it's good. We need it for mitochondrial respiration. But at higher concentrations, these, uh, these uh, copper, free, hot, free copper ions start to accumulate in the cell, and they can really wreak havoc on the cellular components, likely mediated through the production of reaction oxi reactive oxygen species. So they can damage uh, lipid membranes and also uh, degrade proteins and, uh, and cause just some serious problems in the, the functionality of this, this organelle. And copper is actually a fairly common marine pollutant where it's used on the hulls of ships to prevent uh, things from growing on it but that copper can leach from, from those hulls and, and pollute marine waterways. And the effect of copper on, on marine, marine life has been fairly well studied, and Tigriopus actually itself has been used as a model for these ecotoxicology uh, experiments. And previous studies have shown that the uh, copper exposure tends to modulate gene expression of mitochondrial genes, antioxidant genes, a whole suite of, uh, uh, of responses, the physiological level to copper. But I wanted to see how that uh, copper exposure also affected our, uh, the ability of this animal to convert carotenoids into uh, to astaxanthin. Okay, so this project was funded by uh, the N uh, NSF East Asian Pacific Summer Institutes Fellowship uh, that I got in 2015, I think. And um, I spent the summer in Taiwan there with uh, my host, science, host scientist in Taiwan, uh, and also co-author of the paper, Yang Chi Cheng, and uh, Pao Long Huan, uh, a research assistant who uh, helped me uh, quite a bit um, on this project. And so I'm pretty proud of this project because part of this um, project ended up in this publication. Uh, and it was actually the first time that this was, this was my first first author publication. And I actually saw the thing through the entire life of its uh, kind of scientific life from you know, coming up with the idea, getting funded, uh, and then going to do the work, analyzing the data, and then seeing it through the publication. So I'm quite, quite proud of that. Um, there's one problem. Uh, I got this fellowship to go to Taiwan to work with uh, my host scientist, um, but I had, they didn't work on copepods, and I had no idea where these things were. So luckily I found, uh, don't tell the NSF that, uh, I found this paper on the phylogeography of, the, of this Tigriopus japonicus species. This is a, essentially all intents and purposes the same as our Tigriopus uh, californicus, but just lives in East Asia. So here's Taiwan, um, and we've got this site, uh, collection site KL. That's pretty much all I had to go on. So uh, 
I don't know if I'm a millennial, but anyway, using uh, kind of modern uh, you know, internet tools like Google Scholar, I got to doing some investigating. Um, so I zoomed in on Taiwan and Google Maps, all right, and the northeast corner, that's where the KL was, so I zoom in there. Okay, I don't know if you can see that, but here's, uh, uh, it's pronounced Jilong City, but it's K, Keelong uh, City, Jilong City, KL. So I'm like, okay, it's probably that. So I haven't told you a lot about uh, the life history or habitat use of this species, but I know where they should be. They should be in uh, shallow water rock pools along some rocky coastline, okay? So I have that in mind, and uh, we're zooming in here on, on this park called uh, Peace Island, Hepingdoa Park, and I've got some rocky outcrops here. It looks pretty promising. Now, thankfully, uh, there's actually, you're familiar with Google Street View, you take the little yellow guy and drop it. There's a Google Street View, uh, little circles where people have taken pictures all over this park along the coastline. Okay, so when you zoom in on the street view, <laughs> this is what you see. All right, so a, a pretty good looking rock hole and some other uh, places too. So just note this um, island in the back. Um, so I, I got my host to drive me out to this uh, park and to put in the GPS and, and try to find a, a rock that looks like this with that mountain in the background. <laughs> and there's the real life picture. The, the pool is a bit bigger, but that's that same island. I found it from Google Maps and you stick a, a dip net in there and there's uh, thousands and thousands of coke pots in there. So um, <laughs> very, very relieved to be able to get um, get some actual animals to work on. This is. Uh, this is Young uh, Youngchu and uh, Bao Long helping me collect these in the field. So even though I'm not doing bird work, I still got to do some field field work, and uh, so that was fun. Okay, so I got these copepods back into the lab, and I let them oops, let them acclimate for a week, and I checked to make sure they had astaxanthin in them, and they did. Uh, but it was interesting to note that they were at a, a lower concentration of astaxanthin than I'm used to from the Tigrio, or from the California population. Uh, but they had it in them nonetheless. Um, so here's uh, some experimental design here. I split those coke pods into, into two groups, either under control conditions or um, under a, a sublethal dose of, of copper. And um, I uh, put this is so this is essentially a 24 hour acute tox toxicity experiment where I uh, just put them in these solutions for, for 24 hours. And at each time point, I sampled, uh, subsampled some, some groups to do uh, gene expression analysis using quantitative PCR and then to measure their carotenoid profiles uh, using HPLC. So at each time point, 0, 6, 12, and 24 hours, I sampled um, for these two uh, measurements and I added a high concentration of, of green algae that provides those precursors to be able to make acids at each after each sampling point. Um, so, yeah, these are the same genes that I mentioned earlier, well, genes that are uh, involved in mitochondrial uh, physiology, cytochrome C oxidase 1, that's that uh, fourth complex that contains copper, okay, so pretty relevant, and then that glutathione reductase that helps um, re-energize uh, re uh, the glutathione for, for copper uh, binding. Okay, so here are the results. This is the gene expression, uh, the gene expression results, so I'm um, showing results that are comparing the copper exposure to the unexposed copepods. And uh, at these at 6, 12, and 24 hours, look at the mitochondrial genes, see they're upregulated in a time-dependent manner, and uh, glutathione reductase is also upregulated up uh, compared to the control copepods. So this suggests that at least at the transcriptional level, there was some, some response to the copper exposure that involved a uh, mitochondrial um, uh, process. And then when we look at the same time at the amount of astaxanthin present in the two groups, uh, at each time point, we're tracking the amount of, uh, the relative change from time zero in the amount of astaxanthin in the tissues. And we see that a, a sharp increase in the unexposed copepods, uh, but that is much lower, especially at the 12 and 24 hour time points in the copepods that were exposed to copper. Okay, so this provides at least some relationship between uh, manipulation of, of mitochondrial processes and the production or accumulation of astaxanthin um, using this, this copper exposure. I had originally um, proposed this project to be uh, a way to monitor marine pollution health by um, monitoring carotenoid accumulation in animals before and, and, and see how that changes after uh, pollution event. Um, but it 
in this case, it also provides some support that mitochondria might be important in that conversion process. Okay. So the second way that I manipulated mitochondrial function is through hybridization. So it might not be immediately clear how hybridization can affect mitochondrial function, so let's just quickly go over that. So here we are, back at the electron transport system within the inner mitochondrial membrane. This is where the core uh, respiration process, the oxid oxidative phosphorylation takes place, and it's really uh, a function of these protein complexes, uh, where they, they shuttle electrons through these complexes to drive a proton gradient into the into membrane space and, and lead to the production of ATP. So these four complexes are, are really key, and the fifth one uh, makes uh, ATP. Now, this view uh, leaves out some important details that are critical to the function of, the, of this organelle. If you look a little closer at those protein complexes, or, yeah, the protein complexes, we see that they're made up of individual protein subunits, okay? If we look in a little bit more detail, we can see that these protein subunits actually originate from two different genomes. Some come from the mitochondrial genome, genome dark green, and some come from the nuclear genome in light green. So this means that these two proteins have to interact within a, a protein complex for this whole system to work. And because of the higher mitochondrial mutation rates in animals, what ends up happening is we have population-specific uh, uh, interactions here that make these two proteins compatible with each other. And when we have this compatibility, uh, mitochondrial function is good, and we call this uh, mitonuclear compatibility. Okay? So this is population specific. If we look at another population that is uh, not in gene flow with, with this one, it has its own population specific mitochondrial and nuclear uh, compatibility, and as a result, mitochondrial functions uh, is fine. Okay, so how does hybridization induce uh, uh, dysfunction? Well, uh, through hybridization, we're, we're passing uh, mitochondrial genes just from one of the, uh, the parents, to, and it's being forced to interact with nuclear proteins that it's not co-adapted to. And depending on how diverse those populations are, uh, it can have some serious impacts on, on mitochondrial function. So, just showing the same thing here, we're, within each protein complex, we've got these purple nuclear alleles, they're not compatible with these green mitochondrial alleles. As a, a, a consequence of that is, uh, is mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, yeah. And so this is, I'm going to call this mitonuclear incompatibility, so incompatible proteins. All right. The classic example of how hybridization can affect uh, mitochondrial function is, has been in Tigeropus californicus. That's one of the reasons why we got involved in uh, using the species. And there appears to be some consistent consequences to hybridization among some diverse populations. We see hybrid breakdown manifests at the, uh, the, the organismal level, um, impacting fitness. So uh, when we have mononuclear incompatibilities, it tends to um, uh, manifest as fewer offspring produced, lower survival in those offspring, and, uh, and slower developmental times. And at the kind of physiological level, at the mitochondrial level, consistent consequence has always been uh, to show uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. So in this case, showing that um, hybrids are producing less ATP than the parental generation. But if you look at any other marker of mitochondrial function, you'll see the same pattern. And through decades of, of research, papers and, uh, after papers from Ron Burton and his group at UC San Diego, there's always this consistent consequence that, uh, at the uh, hybrid breakdown among diverse populations. It's been linked uh, quite convincingly to uh, the presence of these mitonuclear incompatible proteins affecting uh, uh, mitochondrial function and having pleiotropic effects on there, uh, on the organismal level. So we know that there's consistent breakdown in mitochondria, but again, how does this affect coloration? So nobody's looked at this, uh, thankfully for me, so I have an opportunity to. Um, so a little bit more about where these copepods are distributed. So the Californicus um, uh, species is present all along the western coast of, of North America, and they form these discrete populations living in those shallow tide pools that aren't in communication with the open ocean. So as a result, there's high genetic divergence between populations. So if we take a look at these two populations, yellow and purple, we've got up to, oh, close to 7.5% diver sequence divergence in uh, cytochrome B, that's the mitochondrial complex 3 protein. So this is considered very high divergence among uh, populations that are technically the same species. Um, okay, so. 
In the lab, I took these same populations that have, in the previous studies, shown those classic signs of mitonuclear breakdown from mitonuclear compatibility, and uh, uh, reared, the, reared them out to the, uh, to the hybrid generation to test our hypothesis that uh, these mitonuclear incompatibilities would also affect their ability to produce uh, red pigments. And so I predicted that uh, in the parental, based on the parental generation, hybrids with that mitonuclear breakdown would also show a breakdown in, in red carotid production. Okay, so let's take a look at the results. On average, we can see that the hybrids did produce fewer, uh, less astaxanthin than the parental generation, but there's quite a bit of variability here in the hybrids. And uh, that's, there's a, an inter in interesting explanation for, for why that is, and maybe we can talk about that later, but if we just look at these general patterns between these results and other studies, previous studies that have demonstrated that it's been through mitonuclear incompatibilities, we see a very similar pattern, where hybrids are performing worse on average than the parental generation, <coughs> but there's quite a bit more variability there. So even though I didn't measure mitochondrial function, um, it, it offers uh, some en encouragement for uh, uh, support of our hypothesis. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up now. Uh, so I'm just gonna recap uh, what I've gone over so far. I've provided a, a plausible alternative model for uh, how honesty is maintained from carotid-based coloration. that puts special emphasis on uh, the conversion process of the yellow to red. Uh, citing that might be an important uh, determinant in, in the relationship there. And then I, I demonstrated through meta-analysis that, uh, if you just look at the patterns of published studies, uh, carotid conversion seems to be an important factor. And then I introduced a, a system that I think will be really powerful in, in being able to further test these uh, the predictions of these, uh, this hypothesis, and then offered some support of uh, predictions of those hypotheses that mitochondrial function may play an important role in uh, determining that conversion process. Okay, so there's still quite a, a bit more work to be done in this system, uh, and I'm just kind of starting to scratch the surface, uh, but I think that this hypothesis really stands to, to answer some, uh, to address some decades old answer, uh, unanswered questions in the field of sexual selection and uh, carotid metabolism uh, specifically. And Working with copepods is, is great, but uh, we really do have these questions about birds. But uh, working with copepods first can let us really hone in on some, some more uh, direct evidence that mitochondria might be important, and then we can transfer that information and doing some really tight targeted experiments to see how this plays out, not only in birds, but other crop pigment, pigmented animals as well. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up. There's uh, quite a bit of people to, to thank and acknowledge. Uh, first and foremost, uh, my advisor, Jeff Hill. Couldn't have asked for a, a better advisor. Uh, I'm really grateful for his, uh, his mentorship. Uh, Anna Tucker has been uh, crucial in, in, in science and life as well. And then my committee members, Alan Wilson, Paul Cobine, Jennifer Newbery. Uh, grateful for their support and patience uh, along the way. And my former lab mate, uh, Rebecca Koch, and uh, all of these other collaborators. Uh, thanks for the funding from these different uh, uh, funding sources. And a, a special thanks to my small, uh, growing, uh, loving family in Auburn here, my wife, Anna Tucker, and uh, my dog, Cedar. He's a good boy. <laughs> and with that, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. variation is there in local population versus distant populations of things like mitochondrial genes? Yeah, so the, the, the go-to mitochondrial gene for sorting out phylogenies has often been cytochrome C oxidase 1. That's that fourth complex that I mentioned earlier. And uh, the, I guess the general rule cutoff to, to limit species at that level would be around 2% would be pretty high cutting off there. So then, uh, a species and birds move around quite a bit, so there's a, a lot of gene flow across the range. Uh, generally, see much much lower. Uh, it's 
sequence divergence in that line. So you can kind of keep in with the, the bird side of it. Um, the, the mitochondrial function seems to have an important part of the ion signal. But, um, do you, and feel free to a lot of respect there, but do you think that, what's the scope for kind of female choice being linked to that male signal um, through the mitochondria? Yeah, so that can play out of a, a several different layers. I guess I'll start just at the, at the, the lowest one. And that is that um, just without genetic compatibility or mitochondrial compatibility, uh, we'll leave that aside for now. Functionality of the mitochondria obviously is impacted through uh, disease and parasite flows and that kind of, at the physiological level. So during feather growth, if there's a problem with the mitochondria, um, it's being, well, if there's a problem with the mitochondria and the problem with the animal, it's kind of signaling that through its color production. So during mate choice, can say, okay, there's something going on here. Uh, and, and maybe choose a, a different male. Um, we have some ideas about how that mitonuclear compatibility affecting mitochondrial function might also uh, affect uh, choice to really hone in on um, uh, an animal within the correct species or, or, or uh, mating population, if you want to call it that. Because we have that population specific uh, compatibility that's required for mitochondrial function, if that signals, uh, it's being signaled through coloration the female could assess the compatibility of, of that male's nuclear genes with the population-specific uh, mitochondrial genes that she likely also has. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there any um, sexual selection component of the Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, we definitely uh, have looked into that, and, and we've got those trials in the works. We're, we're mostly through and it's complicated. So I didn't talk about the mating system, but it's really cool. Uh, I think these um, antennae here on, on the males, uh, this is a male, the females don't have those. He uses those antennae to grab onto the backs of uh, virgin females and ensure that she's receptive to mating uh, the females can only mate once. Uh, long story short, in order to determine the, the developmental stage and the sex of uh, the animal, the, the males use those um, horns to, to get a, a chemical signal from the animal's back. We know that that is used in mate choice, um, but whether or not color has been a, a criteria in, in, in under select sexual selection, uh, we perform those experiments by stripping off those chemical signals of females um, and giving a male a choice between a uh, clear female and a, a carotenoid pigmented female. And it, in some cases, they prefer the carotenoid color, colored female, but in other cases, they don't. I've done that supplementation with uh, precursor carotenoids, uh, just a single one at a time, and when you, when you give them the choice between the carotenoid restored copepod and that clear copepod, they tend to go for the clear copepod. So, not quite sure what's going out there, but uh, we're close to trying to figure that out. But uh, they, they, they do have color vision on some level, so it's plausible. And, and I, I will say that I think whether or not sexual selection is a part of this process really shouldn't have too much of an impact on the physiology of that conversion process. It's really what we're trying to kind of work out. But it'd be great if they didn't have a uh, main choice for color. Yes, so, Ryan, when, when people look at the incompatibility, there's a lot of assumptions revolving around the stoichiometry of the proteins that might be incorporated into the complexes. Can you fill me in? Because I can't remember off the top of my head how much if people looked at that. Because you, you assume that you know, if there's two proteins that are needed from the, the nuclear faction, that one is coming from one source and the other is coming from the incompatible source. Yeah. So is that truly the case? Is there really a one-to-one -one stoichiometry? Or is there biases toward particular units? Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if it's one-to-one, -one, but in, in, uh, the variation in, in, in the breakdown, uh, at least in this graph here, is showing why is there so much variation among hybrids. I think that's, I can answer your question and, and explain that. It depends on, well, a, a basic observation is that mitochondrial genes don't recombine, but nuclear ones mm -hmm. do. So um, when you, uh, through hybridization, you've got recombination of the nuclear alleles that are kind of determining the amount of compatible versus incompatible proteins that would be expressed. 
So based on how those alleles get shuffled and, and which um, proteins get produced from, from that, uh, that, that gene determines the, the, the level of the incompatibility. And you can kind of consider this hybrid breakdown to be uh, a recessive trait. So if you at least have one compatible uh, allele, that, that, uh, uh, pro that compatible protein is going to be uh, expressed and, and have okay function. But we do see this kind of variation in the amount of incompatibility within hybrids that could be based on the ratios of the proteins that are, are produced. Uh, one kind of interesting internal control, um, let me go back to one of the electron transport system things here. If you look at complex two, Complex 2 doesn't have any mitochondrial genes. So no matter the combination of nuclear proteins that are present, they can interact fine. You really only see a breakdown when those nuclear alleles have to interact with um, the, the, the mitochondrial genes. And so if you look at complex activity in hybrids that show vast, uh, just very clear breakdown in mitochondrial physiology, complex 2 always works fine, mm -hmm. suggesting that it really seems to matter uh, about the mitochondrial proteins. Okay. Oh, I have a quick question about Coca-Cola. Uh, first of all, this case this this changed my life. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, Anna Tucker made that. Uh, uh, um, but anyway, about the coca So you only looked at the male colors? You didn't do the females? No, I, I, so in, 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 in pretty much in all those studies, I lumped adult coca together. So non gravid females and, and males. When you look at um, non gravid females versus males, there's essentially no difference in the amount of crop notes that they uh, accumulate. Um, but we do know that gravid females, once they start to accumulate eggs, they deposit crop notes to their eggs and their body becomes a little bit less uh, rich in them. Um, but yeah, so good. So the babies come out with a little orange as well? Very orange, yeah. Uh, I don't think I have any pictures of crab females, but yeah, the egg sacs are just individual little spheres of, uh, of, of red, and they're, they're, they're called nauplia, the offspring, they're bright red when they come out, so. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One more question? Yeah, sorry, she kind of talked on that for okay. all. He's right, I want to echo what he said about the cake flag. I haven't had it yet. I like things. User. I was curious about, you said that you, at one point, you changed the diet, the algae that you fed to the coplas in order to, to uh, limit their acidogenic acid, whatever it's yes. called. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yes. You took it out, so I was curious if there were any additional effects. Uh, he just mentioned, uh, he asked about the eggs, and you said they had some quite uh, how they eat the eggs. So there must be like some, maybe there's some value in that, but are there any other effects in sort of uh, changing the diet, increasing the clear to the products, other than those ones related to yeah, um, in general, uh, no, they, they grow fine. I've had, um, like, so not a very fancy culturing system. I've got five gallon Home Depot buckets. I've got like four or five of those full of these yeast fed carotenoid deficient coca pods that have survived for like, like four years now. So, uh, 100 generations or something. Um, yeah, it's a really short life cycle. Uh, they don't tend to do as well under certain circumstances when I'm feeding them the yeast. I think it's more related to uh, water quality issues than, than anything else. Uh, but in the wild, they accumulate lots of proteins, so it's probably used for something. Um, I just actually had a paper accepted where I showed that in this system, they actually do use proteins for antioxidant function, so that's, that's interesting. Uh, in birds, it doesn't seem to be the case, but um, they do accumulate proteins for a reason. And uh, But in the lab, under very benign conditions, they do just fine. Thank you. Okay. Yeah.